Hello, I'm Andrew Jones. I'm an assistant head teacher for CPD at the Reach Free School in Ritmansworth. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about retrieval practice, space distribution, which I often refer to as spacing, and interleaving. Um, these are a number of different areas that the Hearts and Bucks DSA and Challenge Partners have been doing some research on. They're also uh, quite fashionable to mention at the moment, but there are limitations uh, to some of the way studies have been done about them and, and how they're applied in the classroom. However, if, if we look at a quick scenario, let's say you've got a new job. You, you're going to do a new job in September. You, you go into your school and you meet lots of staff on the first day and you're given loads of names. Um, and you, you meet one staff member and you only hear their name once when you're introduced, but they say he hello to you regularly in, in the corridors. Uh, they're very friendly. They often come up to you in the, in the staff room and they ask how you're finding it. But you never quite have that chance to say what's your name or, or come up with a name and you don't hear anyone else mention it. And they often chat to you on, on a Wednesday. And then you get into this situation, this embarrassing situation where suddenly you need to remember who, who they are and you can't remember their name. And one of the reasons for that is, although we know that person, we've not had a chance to practice associating the name with the person. Um, it's happened to me before with colleagues, it's certainly happened with students. And it goes back to this, it's called the forgetting curve. Um, and it's something put together by a cognitive psychologist, um, Herman Ebenhaus, um, some time ago. And essentially it's, it applies to all knowledge. If we learn something, if we don't go back to it, we're gonna forget about it. Um, it's as simple as that. Um, I learnt my times tables uh, when, when I was at primary school. I haven't really gone back to many of them over my secondary education, certainly not in the last few years. And I'm pretty sure if I was to have a competition with my son, he would know his times tables better because I've not gone back over them regularly enough. So bearing that in mind, this is quite important because at the moment we have very knowledge rich curriculum. The, the government changed the curriculum. Um, a lot of policies came in and, and affected this in 2014. And students now need to know an awful lot of knowledge in, in their various subjects. So I, I think retrieval practice does have a part to play. It's not the be all and end all. Um, and some people might say, well, you know, there's more to remembering knowledge to pass exams and things like that. And of course there is. But one of the key things we do as students is we, we teach them to to, to remember things in exams and those exams and those grades in particular will give them life chances. So what is retrieval practice? Well essentially it simply means bringing to mind what you've previously learned and we can do this through a number of ways. We could do it through quizzing and testing, questioning and answering. Um, often it's a very good thing to do at the beginning of the lesson or as a plenary. Uh, you could see if anyone's read um, Rosen uh, Shine's um, Principles of Instruction. He talks about uh, daily review and weekly review, so that's where that would come in. Um, I think retrieval practice can be a good thing to set for homework. So you've already taught the children something and they need to go off and they need to either retrieve the knowledge or the, retrieve the skills to apply to the knowledge. And it would be great if we can teach strategies for retrieval practice. So when students go off and become independent learners, they can do that themselves. So and again, you can see from this slide, again, you know, some people might say, okay, I want you to remember everything you know about this and sketch what you remember about it. Uh, pupils could create flashcards um, and then you could do a quick, uh, quick uh, quiz with the students. Um, and essentially this slide says the same things, but, but to go over it again, because I think it's very important to have some ideas here. You can provide questions or tests for your students, which they must do without the materials in front of them. So they have to retrieve the information from, from their memories. You can get pupils to make list of questions about topics they're doing from memory and then later on get them to go back to them and answer those questions without reference to the materials. You could get them to create flashcards as we've already said and you also get pupils to write down or draw everything they remember about a topic. So it's relatively straightforward and one of the arguments here uh, if we look at popular writing on this is that there's there's a couple of books written over the last 15 years or so that have sold many copies and what, what they argue one is Bounce by Matthew Saeed and the other one is Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell they basically argue that if you look at some of the best people whether it's in athletics uh, whether it's in the fields of science and things these people are not born geniuses um, and Matthew Saeed for example even talks about musical geniuses often they get there through practice. And we could argue retrieval practice is essentially us doing that with academic knowledge and skills. We're gonna make these children fine tune. But there are some pitfalls to this. So uh, Robert Coe, Professor Robert Coe at the um, University of Durham, although he's a big advocate of retrieval practice, he does have a few issues with this. He says sometimes uh, teachers generate retrieval questions that purely 
focus on factual knowledge and don't really get the students to think in any depth. And that's quite a hard one to do because a lot of people talk about low stakes testing, quizzes and short answer tests and things like that. And they are very conducive to facts. But how are we going to get them to think uh, in more conceptual and abstract ways and retrieve knowledge that way? The other pitfall as well is that people often set these uh, low stakes tests, these short tests, and they make some of the questions a bit too easy. And that's great because it can boost students' confidence, but it doesn't provide them with the correct challenge. And another issue he, he raises is that it's great doing retrieval practices, and particularly as Rosenshine would say, daily review. But do we then spend too much time doing it? Uh, if you do a quiz at the beginning and a quiz at the end, do you lose that time for new learning in the middle of a lesson? And of course, there are some research issues here as well. And I'll let you read through this, but a lot of the studies that are done uh, for generating um, arguments for retrieval practice are done in um, cognitive psychology with groups of relatively small sample size or on quite a kind of narrow um, parameters of the learning. So Donoski talks about um, a lot of this research. And he says some things have been done on, on people remembering uh, different types of words and paired associations of words. And he said that that's very good and, and we need to pay attention to that research. But I mean, what does that mean for a learner in the classroom? Um, Van Gogh and, and Sweller, they argue that the, the other problem is, is you can keep testing people on key facts and things, but over time you need to make that more complex. Things need to join up. People need to relate certain elements of facts to other elements of facts. And of course, particularly with retrieval practices focused by and large on these short factual quizzes and things, we do need to look at those more kind of in-depth, more typical assessments where students have to spend longer on it and be evaluative. Although there is an argument that, of course, that's retrieval as well. The other thing as well, and one of the key components of retrieval practice, Doug uh, and at the University of Florida, and we'll come to him later on, he, he's done a lot of work on retrieval practice, and I think some of the best research, and he's, he's someone who really advocates it, but he does say that we need to do more in the classroom uh, to, to, to look at this as well um, and, and to see how this works. Now that then leads us to spacing, uh, and what essentially spacing is, and again I'll, I'll let you read through these slides in, in your own time, but spacing is saying retrieval practice is great and we should do retrieval practice, but we should space it, space it over time, because you know if, if you test someone immediately after they've learned something, and, and it is good to do that, but they're going to do quite well. However, if you leave it two days, they're then going to have to think in a bit more depth uh, about what they've done, and it will be a bit harder to remember. Then if you leave it another two weeks, it's going to be even harder to remember. And one of the reasons for that is that they would have forgotten elements of this. But some people argue that the forgetting bit can be quite useful because the brain will have to work harder to remember the information that's been forgotten or the gaps in the information that is remembered with the bits that have been forgotten. And that in turn will create um, longer, uh, a better long-term memory. So you can see from that graph, you know, maybe you will teach something and then wait two days and, and then uh, give a test and then maybe wait a week and give a test and then maybe a bit longer and give another test. And uh, another cognitive psychologist, uh, Robert J. Marzano, he argues this very similar vein actually to um, Malcolm Gladwell and, and Matthew Saeed in their, in their books. But he says, you know, it takes a long time. Uh, to learn to to kind of master something uh, and he estimates for some things you need 24 practice sessions of at least an hour long to kind of get to to a mastery of a topic in, in most subject areas now we can't quite do that we haven't got the time to do that on the curriculum so we might teach something in a lesson or teach an element of things over a series of lessons but we do need to go back to those regularly spaced intervals so students can practice them and improve their mastery of those subjects um, and again we can see that here uh, there's a very good um, study in, in a book by Carpenter et al and you can find a reference to it um, at the back of these slides and, and then you'll be able to find the PDF on the internet but they argue that when they've done studies and they've tested people at short intervals over a short amount of time um, it, it's, it's okay people do remember things but if you actually expand that amount of time and then expand the intervals as you go along so you do one maybe after seven days you do a test then 37 days and then 70 days in the long run people will remember more when it's spaced that way 
But there are again limitations here, and it's largely the same as we saw before. Um, there is a big argument about whether spacing and space distribution should be equal. So when, when we go back to topics, should it be equally spaced, so two weeks, then two weeks, then two weeks, or is it better to expand it, so two weeks, then a month, then two months? And more work needs to be done on that. Um, the other thing as well is how are these things calculated? I mean, cognitive psychology is a, is, is a science. Um, we are working, of course, in the real world in the classroom, and, and there are questions on how that applies there. And this is the big thing for me. I, I'm a real believer that we can learn from cognitive uh, science and it's very important but we, we do have to be careful of how that's applied in the classroom and I would argue there needs to be more studies done on that, particularly long-term studies or what we call longitudinal studies. So then it brings in interleaving um, and one of the key things with this is if we are to space things over time, do we just test students on the topics they are learning at that time or do we spice it up with, or splice it up with things they've learn over time and all the different topics they've learned. And essentially what interleaving is arguing is that if you look at traditional block learning, you will learn um, a topic over maybe a term or half a term, then you move on to the next one for a term or half a term, and the next one for a term and a half term. And advocates of interleaving say that that's not great because if you were doing RE, for example, if you, if you indulge me and listen to this example, in, in year nine you might do Christian beliefs. Um, and Christian practices. In year 10 you might do Islamic beliefs and Islamic practices. In year 11 you might do the themes, abortion, euthanasia and crime and war. Now at the end of year 11 if you go back to topic 1, Christian beliefs, if you haven't mixed it up a bit those students might not have gone over some of the key elements of Christian beliefs in those other topics. So the argument is you break it up and you do a little bit of Christian beliefs followed by Islamic practices and things like that. Now, some advocates of um, interleaving, and I'll let you go through these slides uh, when you go through through them yourselves, um, argue that, you know, we, we should change the curriculum. Other people suggest, no, maybe we should do just do these things as homeworks and as starters. Now, one of the arguments for interleaving is it, it builds on this idea that the brain has to work a bit harder. But in the long term, it improves the brain's ability. And this is Stephen C. Panner. Um, a, a, a psychologist at the University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA. Um, the, the brain will build up a, a better ability to tell things apart uh, because it's having to work harder with these different topics and building up from these different questions. Um, and therefore it strengthens memory association over, over time um, and that allows it to be committed to long-term memory better. Now if you go and read Stephen C. Pan's work, I mean he does talk about the the cognitive psychology behind this much better than I do. And it's the same with Doug Ruhr at the University of Florida. Um, and I'll let you read this slide at your own time, but he's done a lot of word association studies and found that if you interleave uh, people learning new words, if you interleave the, the, the learning of those new words, so you don't kind of get one category of words and learn all those, and then another category of words and learn all those, if you mix it up, it allows them to differentiate between those complicated words or those words we confuse a lot easier. And he give the, gives the example of allusion and illusion, uh, which even I, if I'm honest, uh, often, often mixed up as well. And there's plenty of evidence for interleaving. You, you can find it in maths, you can find it in art, you can find it um, in, in um, uh, zoology, I guess, looking at birds. I know there is a technical term for, for bird watching, um, engineering and, and, and medical knowledge. And I'll just give you this example here. Um, some people looking at interleaving, they're looking at uh, how people could choose different art styles or understand different styles of painting and they did a series of tests where they would block the learning so they teach them about Van Gogh I'm sure everyone knows that first picture is by Van Gogh and his style of painting they do a series of lessons on those and then Monet uh, they do a series of lessons on Monet and then Constable they do a series of lessons on Constable and test them on, 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 on um, being able to identify different styles at the end and then they did a different way of doing it where they kind of did a, a number of different lessons but they refer to all of them in those lessons and they found that the students that have learnt via the lessons where they're referring to all of them in the different lessons i.e. they were interleaved did better at the end um, and you can read through these slides and see the similar things down there with, with butterflies and, and this study here is probably the best for us to, to look at in terms of learning in the classroom. Uh, Doug Rora at the, the, the University of Florida, he looked at the idea that in maths lessons for, for middle school pupils, if you did homeworks 
where you went back over previous topics that the students weren't currently learning. Um, it really helped the students in the long run. So you wouldn't jettison what you're doing in the, uh, apologies, that's my timer, in, in the um, actual classroom. But when you, you set your homeworks, you would mix up the topics. You would go back over previous learning and not just focus the homework on what they learned that lesson. And he found that after doing this with two groups, a control group and a participating group, the students that had interleaved the different skills uh, did 70, or on average, 76% uh, of them did better than those that didn't. So there does seem to be considerable evidence out there. Um, I'll let you read through these slides in a bit more depth on how this works if you're interested in it. Um, and I, I think that would be quite good, particularly the idea of desirable difficulty, contextual interference um, and elaborate rehearsal. So have a look through those. And if you want to take them into a bit more depth, go off and uh, have a look at the, the references and you'll be able to find most of these um, pieces of work on, on, the, um, on the web. Now, again, I'll let you look at this example as well of blocked versus interleaving um, curriculum in RE and I'll allow you to make what you think of that. Um, and this is my approach to, to interleaving because I do believe in retrieval practice and I do believe in space, space practice um, and I do believe in interleaving. And, and if I'm honest, it's, it's got me quite good results in my pupils. Um, I've devised this. So with my year 10s, when, when we do a, um, a topic on, on crime, they will do a starter activity where the first three questions will be on the previous learning. This is from a slightly different unit. And then the next ones, the, the questions four and five, will be from a previous unit. And then question six will be from another previous unit. Then I'll set a homework. One homework question will be based on the current unit. And then another homework question will be based on a previous one. And you can see in week one that those uh, topics are all mixed up. So they got four different topic areas they'll be looking at that week. So the main thing they're learning, plus um, some starter questions from two previous units, and then a separate one on the homework there. That's how I am interleaving. Um, and it, it did give my pupils last year a Progress 8 score of 1.8. Um, and again, there might have been other things that contributed to that, but I, I think interleaving did help. However, you would need to talk about this with your colleagues at school. So I think there's some strong benefits here. It does help uh, mastery and long-term learning. Um, if, we, if we mix things up um, in a plan and ordered way, it does allow the students to have that element of difficulty. Um, it doesn't feel though no, initially like it's working. Some students object to it, particularly when you're mixing up assessments and things, but it, it does seem to have a, have a have an impact. There are limitations though. We've got to be wary of these interleaving studies. A lot of them again come from psychology where they're quite small, small groups and sample groups there. Um, they haven't got the diversity of learners, of course, as, as the school. Um, a lot of them are um, short term. And, and we've got to remember as well that some of the short term effects of getting students to interleave leave the anxiety and the confusion needs to be be considered um, in in and and, cap, and and compared to the long-term benefits there um, and also as well we should really investigate how this ab applies to different subjects over a long-term basis more research needs to be done so I, I still believe though interleaving does help mixing up topics uh, particularly through uh, starter activities and perhaps uh, homeworks and assessments uh, is really useful um, and it encourages in-depth pro processing of the material. Um, I, I do think though you need to go and, and have a look at some of the, the references I've got uh, coming up as well. Again, you shouldn't interleave top topics that are too different or too similar because um, the effect can be minimal, but if you go back over the literature on that, you'll, you'll see what I mean by that. And also you need to figure out what works best. So if you, if you do think that there's a lot here with retrieval practice, spacing, and interleaving, please go off and have a think and, and talk to your colleagues about how that might work in your context. Okay, and here are the references, it's worth going through those, and I hope this uh, quick, very whistle stop presentation was useful to you.